Hello everyone, it is Sunday the 11th of December. Welcome back to the D3D Thor Football Podcast dedicated to all things Leagues 1 and 2. That was painful last night, wasn't it? The England game. Um, it's brutal, this sport. I wasn't really impressed by that referee for the england France game who, to be honest, probably wouldn't have looked out of place doing Gloucester City v Darlington that happened on Saturday instead. But um, we will be back to go out again next time, of course, in the Euros and World Cups to come. If you are still feeling a bit down about it, I, I just remember that there will have been people in Scotland, Ireland and Wales that went out on the piss last night because of that. Your life could be a lot sadder than it actually is. Let's be real <laughs> about it. Whilst yeah. the World Cup quarterfinals have been in action, though, the EFL continues to chug along, albeit this weekend the freezing cold weather has left us with a reduced slate across the Friday and the Saturday. We've had a total of nine games in League One, six in League Two, fewer games to focus on, but I'm not changing with my ways. I still have no time for any of these nil-nil. So if you want to feature in this podcast, be more eventful. I've got no care for these college games at all. It's Thor here to run through the games from this weekend. It is myself, Edward Walker, joined by David Jenkin, James Richards and Harry Thomas. Lads, quickly, how are we doing? Had a good weekend? Good week? Uh, could have been a better weekend given the score yesterday. Um, you know, oh, Thursday was all right. Well, it was OK. It was OK, wasn't <laughs> um, it? Even that, like, you know, it's, it's unbelievably impressive that we can perform really well in the cup competitions but have no sort of quality in the league at all it's uh i do not understand gillingham at all harry james yourselves yeah i'm good i took uh i took my family to a local event yesterday and the kids went on donkey rides and my my wife who has uh asd uh is very uh picky about what she eats but i got her to try some of the uh roasted chestnuts only for her to sort of take a bite and tell me these are pretty rough i said well you meant to peel them first <laughs> <laughs> so yeah not the uh-huh. not the greatest uh experience for her i think trying to eat the uh, skin of a i don't know are they con- are they actually conkers or are they different uh oh, I, I, i'm not an expert on nuts i couldn't tell you yeah but uh yeah so that was that was quite amusing but uh yeah my kids yeah my kids had a good time and uh my daughter went on a donkey donkey ride as around a field so there you go wonderful stuff <laughs> excellent harry yourself yeah not too bad thank you uh, i made the wise decision to not go to grimsby yesterday uh, so I watched it from the comfort of my own bed on iFollow. Um, obviously, other football streaming services are sometimes available. Um, but yeah, it, it softened the blow a little bit, knowing that I could put my laptop down and I was already at home rather than four hours of train journeys away. Yeah, I, I noticed that the um, National League put out their own streaming service, didn't they, during, I think it was this week, and uh, I got a bit of a mixed response as well. I think it's dead, yeah, so. it'd be, be interesting to see how that goes, really. Indeed. A mind before we get going, this podcast is in partnership with The Big Step, which tackles football's relationship with gambling. There is an excessive presence of gambling adverts within football, and The Big Step continues to do great work to raise awareness about the dangers of gambling and the impact it can have on so many people's lives. Just on that, Ed, uh, just very quickly, if there is anyone out there suffering from gambling addiction and they're just afraid to reach out or... Uh, don't you know don't don't feel isolated do do give us um get out there and contact someone you can follow the the big step uh at the underscore big step on twitter they have been through what you're going through they'll be able to help you so do not suffer in silence absolutely a big thank you as well to all our patreon members those who sign up for as little as well just one pound per month can get access to additional d3d Thor daily podcast episodes throughout the week they are produced by james richards and they focus in depth on individual clubs and provide previews to some of the most eye-catching fixtures in league one and league two each weekend did you really have eye-catching fixtures because there was basically only a handful taking place this well weekend, I, I cursed them all i actually recorded it before they'd all been called off oh. and basically all the ones i, I previewed were called <laughs> off I, it's, I can assure people as well it's not a it's not a podcast about oxford united every every day which uh it's every other day it's every day every, yeah it's just every other day yeah that's right yeah. <laughs> yeah. you can sign up to that now at patreon.com slash d3d4 football let's get going and we will begin as always with the world's best third tier league one straight into league one um only a handful of games to go through as i said the weather really hit some of the pitches certainly in this League, we lost someone Friday, we lost someone the day of the game as well. It's always quite frustrating, but it, it's this time of year, it does happen. But James, we're going to start with what was maybe the most eventful game of the day. Shrewsbury Town 3, Bolton Wanderers 2. Yeah, great result for, for Shrewsbury Town. And uh, Steve Cottrell absolutely delighted post-match with his players. Uh, said he had a sneaky feeling that Rob Street and uh, Christian Sadie would score. They both did. And um, a really good performance. I mean, they, you know, they left it late. They they Bolton Bolton essentially. Um, 
you know, Shea Dunkley with the winner in the 92nd minute. And uh, it was, yeah, it was a really, really solid performance from Salop, who are starting to, you know, despite having injury problems and a very small squad, they did invest in good players who are versatile. And I think um, this is why they've done that. Steve Cottle's obviously got Jordan Shipley playing that left wing back role. He set up the early goal for Rob Street to score his first for the club. And he's been, you know, he's been struggling. I think he's needed this goal. And to score within two minutes, not the ideal start for Bolton. Um, but, but they probably should have capitalised on it a bit more. They didn't. Dion Charles equalising on 13 minutes after excellent play on the on the wide right with Kieran Lee and Gethin Jones. Uh, and working the space for Gethin Jones to cut it back for Dion Charles to finish really well. And then, you know, second half, they, they go and score. Um, again, Dion Charles, a breakaway. Shea Dunkley fouling his man and, and Dion Charles stepping up to thump the penalty basically through Mark Morosi. It literally, yeah. I don't know how he didn't quite stop it. I think the power behind it. This is why I say I always hit penalties with power because even if, uh, you know, it does go towards where the keeper is, it's got more chance of going in than these. We've seen some dreadful penalties in the World Cup, like Japan. Oh, it's, it's the run ups. Oh. I just can't stand the run ups. It's just so. I love Shearer's penalties ridiculous. if you remember them. Just He just smacked yeah. it, just smacked it in. And, you know, of course, no one, no one will score them all as we saw with Harry Kane sadly yesterday, but, you know, he just got to hit it and. And, and Dion Charles did exactly that, went straight through Marco Morosi to give them the lead. Um, and then a very frustrated Ian Eva, you know, saying that there's no way we should have lost this game. We were the better team for 74, 75 minutes. And uh, then we just stopped doing what we were doing well and uh, let Shrewsbury get, you know, their, their, the ball into the players that they, they were looking to, like Christian said, he had a great game. I mean, you know, if you watch the first goal, actually, the way he held it up in, the, uh, in the channel and then, uh, fed it to, uh, I think he fed it to John Shipley, then knocked it back for Rob Street to score. I mean, he was good all game, Christian Sadie, and he scored, obviously, this equaliser corner in the second phase wasn't cleared. I think Flanagan it was who crossed it back in for Dunkley to head towards goal and say he volleyed it in to make it 2-2. And, uh, you know, Shea Dunkley a goal and assisting this game because he came up late with yet another late winner. He's done it already this season. And this was... This was great because there was great banter in the crowd. Uh, Bolton fans saying you should have gone shopping when they were two and up to the to the Shrewsbury fans. Who obviously, when they got the late winner, turned it around and sang it right back at <laughs> sang it right back at the Trotter supporters who travelled in great numbers again, sixteen hundred of them I think in the away end. And given the weather and the conditions of travel, they they do support their team brilliantly. I do wonder though, and I would be interested to get your guys' take on this. Like James Trafford, I feel really should have done better with the with the Shea Dunkley goal. He he didn't really jump for it. He almost just fell into Dunkley, who got a huge leap. I mean, it was a really immense leap from Dunkley to head it down into the net. Um, but, you know, when it's almost under the crossbar, and the goalkeeper had, had room. There was no one really in front of him. He really should have done I felt better with it. Um, and it's a disappointing result for Bolton, but a great result for Salop, who, you know, I, I really do, like I said, despite the fact they've got problems with injuries, I, I like what they're able to do. I think they're impressing um, and you know, for for what they've got in that squad and for the players that they've got, they've they've had a great season. I mean, they're eighth in the table, um, I think, in in the home stand. I mean, they've got um, 17 points at home this season, which for a team over the last few years who've really struggled, that's not bad. They've struggled to do well at home, um, and it's put them in in good stead. The tenth overall, of course, in League One with 29 points from their 21 games. So going going well, back to back wins for the first time. I think it's since October for them now. And um, a very big, uh, big result for them on Saturday. Yeah, very good result. Echoing your, your thoughts from earlier, I think Bolton would probably be disappointed with all three goals they let in, really. The state of them, they all felt quite messy to me, especially that Dunkley one and perhaps even Sadie's equaliser as well. Poor there was set a start piece I, defending, yeah. Yeah, there was a start I came across during the week, which um, I believe before this weekend, the last time a Shrewsbury striker had scored was the end of September. Yeah, that's right. It had been it's ages. a long time. Yeah. And Shrew's been getting away with it because of that ability, as you say, of Shipley at left wing back and Bayless in attacking the field and Luke Lee from a dead ball as well and the set piece threat that comes from the centre backs as well. And I think Shrewsbury's 11, Jazz, I've noticed, is pretty consistent at the minute. It seems to be the same 11 and then quite a young bench, I've noticed as well recently. Well, they don't have the depth. You know, um, Aidan O'Brien's been out. Um, they've lost George Nurse for the season, uh, Dan O'Do for the season. Uh, Carl Winchester was playing but struggling to breathe for for much of the game yesterday properly because he was suffering from some sort of virus so he had to come off uh they've had uh i think is it taylor moore moving around in several mm-hmm. positions and i think he he filled right wing a, back yesterday wasn't he yeah and then i think he went central and, and record pike came into the the right wing back position when uh 
when Winchester went off. So they've got versatile players, and that's really helped them because if they didn't have that, you know, I don't know what they'd be able to do. I think the strongest thing about Shrewsbury is their consistent back three. That's been and yep. their goalkeeper. They, they've been very solid in that in that respect, and you can see why uh, they're in the top half of the table, not not doing too badly at all. Yeah, and a little bit like Bolton as well. I think they've got this quartet of strikers that they rotate. It tends to be um Street and Sadio Starby. You'll find Tom Bloxham and Ryan Bowman get brought on as well. And you see with that quartet that Bolton have as well, um, Bakayoko, Charles, Bodvars and uh, Kachunga as well. I think Alpha Lyon started up top to them yesterday. There's rotation between that. And it's good to see both strikers that started getting goals as well because we've been waiting a while for those forwards to certainly get goals on a great win for Shrewsbury Town. Harry, Ipswich Town 2, Peterborough United 1. Yeah, this was a great win for League One's new table toppers, who are already looking keen to show me up for predicting that they were going to finish outside the top two. Uh, it was a concerning fourth consecutive loss for the posh, though. Game didn't really start brilliantly for Ipswich. After just a quarter of an hour, they had to sub off Janoi Donassian through injury. And they brought on Kane Vincent Young. So Kieran McKenna will be hoping that's nothing serious. Obviously, games come thick and fast at this time of the year. And you don't want to be losing somebody who's a, a regular week in and week out. Surprisingly, Connor Chaplin hadn't actually scored in the league for Ipswich since mid-September, so he'll have been relieved to see his first half header hit the back of the net after 21 minutes. I feel like people don't say this that often about headers, but it was a really impressive finish. It was sort of a little bit behind him almost the cross, and he was quite deep into the box, uh, so he did well to find the bottom corner. Yeah, I love headers like that. Love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a very underrated type of goal for me. I feel like they go under the radar because I suppose that they're not from... 40 yards out, but it, it's a very difficult skill and uh, he's made it look very easy off what probably wasn't a brilliant cross, to be honest. Yeah. Johnson Clark Harris then hit the crossbar with a free kick from about 35 yards out. Otherwise, the game had been all lip switch. However, on around the half hour mark, Frankie Kent had an equaliser for Peterborough, scored with a close range header after an absolute peach of a cross from Kwame Poku, who I can see attracting interest in January, especially if Peterborough's form doesn't improve. I, I can see Maybe not those teams at the top of League One, but potentially sort of going up into the championship, I can see somebody taking a punt on him. After that, the game opened up and both sides created chances before Champlin had put Ipswich back in front, rifling in from a Leaf Davis corner. Freddie Ladapo then thought he'd finished off the victory with just over two minutes to play, but his effort was disallowed for offside. Town fans will be delighted with the three points and will also have been pleased to see Sonny Aluku back in the starting 11 for the first time since August. He's back from a hamstring injury. And he's definitely going to help to bolster their attacking options, which they've already got a fair amount of, to be honest. Yeah, Marcus Hanna's out injured, isn't he, at the minute as well? So yep. um, yeah, good time to get him back. Mm, it's fortunate. Fort- yeah, I'm really, I'm really glad you mentioned Sonny and Luke as well. That is great to see him back because I think Carl Edwards is someone who's operating that attacking midfield role and had some good results as well. And then still so much praise to give to someone like Cameron Humphreys, for instance, who's really provided such a good partner to Sam Moore's in Lee Evans' absence as well in midfield. You know, Tyrese John Jules is out for the is he out for the season? He's out for a while, isn't he? As well, it could so, be a period. But they got Hadme back, thankfully, so he's back available as an option. Absolutely, to be playing in there as well. Peterborough, I feel like I'm probably echoing the fans when I say, how are they still in the top six? I, I really I'm don't. So unimpressed with them at the moment. Yeah, this is the second time they've lost four in a row this season in the league, which is remarkable that they're in the playoffs with a record of that nature. You know, they've lost ten games. Yeah, and. Uh, I've written in my notes that they've only kept five clean sheets in the league all season and only one of those has come since September. So, I mean, five on its own doesn't sound great, but they've only kept one in in sort of nearly three months. I think this is the interesting thing, though, isn't it? Because we talk about teams with these unbeaten runs, but if you're drawing a lot of games, you're not really getting many points. Whereas Peter, if you look at them, they've had 10 wins, one draw and 10 defeats. And that's why, despite all those losses, they're still actually on parity of points with many of those teams up there with them. Yet they've... They've lost twice as many games, for example, as Derby County. You know, they've lost well well more than Portsmouth. But the fact is they've won 10. <laughs> Does the inconsistency of formations worry you, James? I know it's, they went 3-5-2 yesterday. I've seen them 4-3-3 and a 4-2-3-1 recently, for instance. Uh, Does, played, yeah. Do you get the sense McCann's not really sure what the best setup is at the minute? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, he doesn't He doesn't have a clue about where to where to put all his eggs, really. And, and, and the problem with that is... You're not going to be you're not going to be hatching a good side from that, and, and it's it's problematic for Peterborough because they've got talent, especially going forward. Um, you know, you look at their team. Maybe their midfield lacks a certain kind of player, which you see in in some of the top top teams, perhaps. But I don't think they're lacking. I mean, they've got Johnson, Clark, Harris. They've got 
Efron Mason Clark and Kwame Pocky, who you know, the Harrison Burrows as well, who can all play in, in that role behind uh, the striker. They've got Jack Marriott as a great option as well. I mean, it's, they should be doing a lot better than this. Um, their defence is, is fine. I don't think there's many issues. And their goalkeeper's been pretty solid all season. So, you know, McCann has to sort this out somehow. And like you say, changing, chopping, changing formations doesn't ever really, for me, do uh, do a team justice. They never seem to be able to, to play well unless they've got a consistent lineup. They need to take influence from Ipswich, who are constantly 3 4 2 1. Yes, the personnel has to change because of availability, but you know what formation you're getting with McKenna Ipswich, and they have been rewarded by going top of the league this weekend. James, another game to talk about. Milton Keynes Dons 1, Fleetwood Town 2, and some news after the game as well to talk about the show. Yeah, which is nice for this podcast to be able to talk about a manager <laughs> being sacked, be- you know, like before the week, a week later, because it seems to always happen that way. But. Um, uh, this was one of the games I previewed, which um, survived the slate, you know, survived the weather. <laughs> and be- I previewed it because I felt this was massively important for MK Dons. They're playing a team in that sort of bottom group of clubs, not to take anything away from Fleetwood, who have got a superb away record. I think it's like the fifth best. It is, yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. They, I think you tweeted that, didn't they? They've only lost twice, is that right? They've, they've been beaten by home. Port Vale and Exeter away from home in the league, and that's it. Yeah, who are both very, very good sides in their own right as well. I mean, so they went there and but MK Dons played well. Let's not let's not be unfair to them. They played well. They had the majority of the opportunities. Um, Fleetwood defended for their lives. Bodies on the line. Goalkeeper was great. Scored um, a couple of cracking goals in, in some respects. But what I'd say is they take the lead against the team down there. They've got to be good enough to see it out. And this is where Liam Manning in his post-match was talking about. It's on the players now. We've done everything we can as coaches and the coaching staff to get this team prepared for matches like this. They need to be braver. They need to make the right decisions. I have to say, as good as Carl Johnson's finish was, it was so naff defending. It's just too easy. Too easy for him to cut back in and get that shot away and equalise. Dan Batty, you can't do much about that. You might say they should have done better with the first ball and stuff like that. But Dan Batty's finished. He's a player I really admire and he smashed it in just to rub salt in the wound and take a bit of a smash and grab, which is perfect for, for what Fleetwood did. But then no surprises to me that after this game, they signed this, the, the board had had enough. They've sacked Liam Manning. One win in 11 at home this season. That's five points from available 33 at Stadium MK. That is the record that has got him sacked. It's, it is a simply unacceptable record for a team that has, I think, still enough talent in it to be better than where they are. They are, they are well adrift, you know, and and they shouldn't be because, you know, you look at some of the clubs like Accrington have struggled, Cambridge in a, in a real sort of bit of a rut trying to find victories. They should be closing that gap. You know, Forest Green are, are doing what they're not, and uh, MK Dons. I don't know. I'd, I'd, it'd be interesting to hear your takes on Liam Manning sacking. He, he, I just think he, he'd run out of ideas with his team, maybe. It's just an example of the ruthless business that is football. I mean, you go back six months, he was the hottest property in ESL management, or certainly one of, with the work they've done with MK Dons. And it's one of the most bizarre things, what's happened to MK this season. I, I was there at Stadium MK last weekend for a one or draw with Burton, and their first half in particular was so flat, so lacking ideas. There seemed like a real lack of dynamism in midfield that was there. Now, of course, you lose Scott Twine, you're going to lose that individual quality there. That's he was Harvey a superstar. as well, didn't they, in midfield? Yeah, was, losing Harvey. I almost yeah. wonder if losing Hiram Burting might have been a big problem as well, because it looked at them and think, you're missing that really dynamic presence. McEachern and Bradley Johnson are not the same level. Dawson Devoy, I think, kind of can be every now and then, but I, it almost looked to me a bit like Hiram Burting could have been useful in that midfield to them at the moment. You and I thought they'd replace those players maybe in the aggregate. We did, yeah. They Connor did. Grant's, Connor did Grant's they? the one I look at. When you play this 4 2 3 1, that attacking midfield is still so integral to the build up play. And he's a good guy, Connor Grant. I liked him at Rochdale, but it's quite a jump up to come from League 2 to League 1, really. And it, he doesn't really seem to be having the effect I want him to in that position. I just think that, uh, like you said, we, we, we were hoping their recruitment was better than it, it perhaps looked. And it's turned out to be pretty poor. And left them, you know, very, very short in, especially with the style they want to play. And I think we talked about this in earlier pods. You know, when you're not able to play due to personnel, the style that you've you've pinned yourself on, but you don't, you haven't recruited for maybe a second, a, a plan B, like a, going a bit long if you need to. You're left with a, a lack of identity, and and yeah, it's it's left them really struggling. But one win at home all season, terrible. It's the worst home record in the entire division. I, mm. I hope the return of Moisa, what we've had in the last month or so, was going to change things for them, and it, it's not. They're, they're a complete shadow of the team 
we thought they were going to be this season. And uh, I don't know what comes next. I, I don't know what names are going to be in the mix of this. I'm, I'm fascinated by it. It's going to be an interesting period looking ahead for MK Dons to keep yeah. an eye on. David, a local clash in Gloucestershire. Forest Green Rovers 1, Cheltenham Town nil. Yeah, the inaugural uh, League One El Bosico is you. Uh, no, uh, sorry, sorry, budget. sorry. I can't. I, I got told off for doing that. You, you got told off? I it? got told off. Cheltenham fans oh. do not approve of it, so uh, don't. <laughs> it. Spare yourself the blushes. I got well, told let's, off. Let's just go with the inaugural League One uh, derby between these two sides then. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, for this one, it seemed mostly like one way traffic, to be honest. Uh, maybe that's why the Cheltenham fans weren't too happy, because uh, Forest Green seemed like they were pretty uh, pretty in control of this whole game. Um, the only goal of the game coming from Brentford Loney, Harry Boy's uh, free kick, which was headed in by Miles Pitt-Harris for his third of the season. Um, yeah, Forest Green just seeming, in general, the best team throughout the game. Um, Cheltenham getting a couple of chances, but nothing particularly noteworthy here. Um, definitely... And a much needed win for Forest Green um, puts a one point behind Cambridge, who I will say that I'm I'm considerably worried about. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you know that's that's a win that they definitely needed and probably deserve on the balance of this fixture. Yeah, um, Forest Green, the the player I want to notice on to them, they've had a really good positive couple of results recently. A win over Cambridge last week and this win over Cheltenham as well. I feel like Dylan McGeeks played a big part of this. He was a three agent signing. I formerly remember being at Sunderland as well. And he's come into that midfield and it does seem, James, to have clicked something in them. They do seem to be a better side with him in there. Absolutely. I wasn't sure at all what to expect from him. Um, but he has just that bit more grit and experience. I mean, mm. they've got David Davis, haven't they, who they signed from Shrewsbury, but he's been out injured for what seems like ages. And he, you know, he, he's an, uh, he's a decent player at this level for sure, but this guy's come in and I think he's he's been really really good for them um, because they have got some good young players, Boyce, McAllister, Pete Harris in there. Uh, I think March is is has been pretty important. Remember they've got no Matty Stevens for for most of the. I do think Connor Wickham's making up to what Matty Stevens' absence is though. Well, I think he's been an excellent signing with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree with with what he brings to the table and um, I I mean for me when I previewed this game, I mean this one did survive as well and. I felt that Cheltenham had to go there, and although it's a it's a derby, just don't lose it and keep that nice gap between themselves and, and for a screen. Don't give your rivals an opportunity to close that gap a bit. They weren't able to do that. I thought it's a bit of a flat performance from uh, from Cheltenham, to be honest. But yeah, I think for a screen now they've got a few players coming back from injury. You can see them starting to find a little bit more uh, confidence and, and they're starting to get a few more results. Yeah, and they had to. Have- Put Carl McAllister at right wing back yesterday. Corey O'Keefe got um, two yellow cards against Cambridge, so he's suspended for this one. They'll have him back as well, and he can be a good right wing back as well. It's weird. I, I, I've had a bit of talk with other people before about the relegation conversation, and I, I kind of put Thoris Green out of it because I thought they were the one that struggled most. And I'll tell you what, right now, they're looking the best one out of the thought to actually get out of the bottom at the minute. They're a point off Cambridge right now. I was going to say, if anyone else you expect to fall into that kind of region at the moment, given current form, it probably would be Cambridge, wouldn't it? I mean, out of those teams, they, they for me, are certainly the ones that I worry the most about. Yeah, absolutely it agree is. with that. Cambridge, I mean, Cambridge, the problem with them is they've they've got injuries to like Liam O'Neill, who I think giving him another contract now seems pretty regretful. They've got Adam May, who drives the play quite well out injured. And Dimitar Mitov unavailable as well. Yes, and the the problem is they don't have... They've got two youngsters in Warman and Simpa who are playing alongside Digby, but neither of them are... You know, it's a very big task for young players like that to come in in a team that doesn't have many other options. They look really short of players and actually quite short of confidence, Cambridge, as they've dropped down uh, down the table. I think it's one win in 10 or something, or one win in 11 for them now, which is... No good, uh, mm-hmm. and it's it's been amazing their fall from from the sort of upper reaches of the table down to where they are now. Yeah, Mark Bonner maybe a little bit like Liam Manning. He was hot stuff probably a couple of months ago, and it's probably not going to be people's radar right now with the way Cambridge are going. David, let's stay in the West Country and look at Bristol Rovers one, Port Vale nil. Yeah, this was uh, Joey Barton's 100th game, his Centurion game in charge for the gas. Um, luckily for him, it ended in victory. Um, Alan's, Alan, Alan? Not Alan. I don't know why I've gone for Alan. Aaron Collins <laughs> grabbing, grabbing a late winner in this one in the 87th minute. Uh, John Marquis tipping the ball over the top. Um, Collins in a physical battle with Forrester. Uh, beats him to the ball, kind of runs across the 16-yard box. Uh, nice. Port Vale uh, fans are unhappy finish. about that. What's your thoughts on it? Um... There is an argument that it could be a foul. It's a push in the back. Um, but 
I mean, having seen it, I, I made sure I watched it a couple of times, and I do feel like maybe Forrester was a bit off balance anyway. The referee, um, Fran Singham, would have given it. I, he would have given anything <laughs> if, it was, uh, if it was a French player or anyone else. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah def- definitely noteworthy for, uh, for an EFL fixture, that guy. Um, but yeah, I mean, really lovely finish from Aaron Collins in the end to, to put the ball beyond Stevens. Um, I think from a Port Vale perspective, that was probably quite hard done by as well, considering just moments earlier, um, the captain, Tom Conlon, failed to convert, um, and James Belshaw made an absolutely wonderful fingertip save, which then sent them on the counter to get that goal. Um, so, yeah, I mean, look, Rovers under Boston are going really well this season. Um, they're unbeaten in their last four games. Um, just in general, like, seem to be really good. And I mean, I know um, Aaron Collins is someone we've highlighted a few times, but I just want to highlight him because I think in certain lights, I don't think he necessarily gets the credit that he deserves. Um, considering he's got 18 goal involvements this season, that's 11 goals and 7 assists in 21 games, um, which is 56% of Bristol Rovers' entire Matt, season goal good. contribution. 56%. Um, 56%. So it's more than half of their entire team's contributions towards goal. It's phenomenal. Yeah, great. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, with those statistics, he's averaging a goal every other game. Um, I mean, keeping him fit is going to be absolutely huge for Bristol Rovers. And I think so much of their attacking play and so much of their play this season has gone through him. I mean, he's he's such a consistent member of that side as well, having been involved in 98% of Rovers' accumulated minutes across the entire season in the league, at least. Um, it's just phenomenal, the impact he's having on this team. And I think, you know, without him... If for whatever reason uh, Barton loses him, I think that's going to be a real big blow to this team. So I think keeping him fit is going to be the real key thing for Rovers this season. You might be onto something with this Alan Collins idea that they give him a different <laughs> persona and then they could sell Alan Collins off to someone else and keep Aaron at Bristol Rovers instead. Yeah. One one thing about this this game, guys, and I don't know if it actually did go ahead, but Bristol Rovers fans were going to do a, a minute's applause on in the 18th minute for Ellie Clark, who uh, Dale Clark's daughter, who committed suicide last season. Um, just a great tribute from them and just a really sad situation. And again, like it's all about, it was you know, mental health. If someone is struggling with mental health, if you know someone who struggles, you know, encourage them to reach out because that is so tragic. Such a young person to, 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 you know, take their own life in, in such desperate circumstances. And my heart goes out to Daryl Clark and his family for their loss. Um, I don't know how you, you'd continue coping with, with something as, as, serious as that in your in your in your life but um great tribute from bristol rovers fans um the, the relationship between gas stands and daryl clark will be endless yeah it, there's so much love between the two of them and it's great aaron collins yeah the superstar i want to mention josh coburn as well who is really electric i love that run he makes in behind constantly because he knows he's going to get picked up by collins or the midfield ahead of him as well he's such a hands on to deal with as well didn't score on the night but there were some really good opportunities that jack stevens had to deny as well bristol rovers are good and a quick mention by the way three of the four promoted sides from last season in league one port vale 11th bristol rovers 12th exeter city 13th they're not just competing in this division james they're kind of eyeing up those top places the gap above is not too big at the minute yeah and they're all they're all stable sides with with um really good ownership aren't they at the moment you know bristol rovers had kept Joey Barton on. He's built from the squad he uh, had last season. Their owner's been very supportive of, of him. The new owners at Port Vale have put in the processes and then and the support that Daryl Clark needs to, to get this team moving forward. Exeter are, are a prime example of a, a really well-run club um, who use their, their sort of yeah, academy to bring players through and then fund their team by selling on those talents. Um, you know, and they're sort of fan owned. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful model. And it's just a nod that if a team is well run, how far they can go with that model. Uh, and then if you look at Scunthorpe and Oldham, who were both in League One not so long ago, now obviously, um, due to ownership issues, pushed to the brink of like relegation from the National League. And uh, Oldham, I have a more confidence with their new owners that they, they'll find a way out of it. Um, Scunthorpe, they, you know, there's better news about them changing hands, but it's, it's, you know, it's a big ask, isn't it? Changing a team round that's been on such a free fall. So I'd, I'd say if you've got good owners, you know, the jump from, from League Two into League One is, is not insurmountable. And we're seeing it in prime examples with these clubs this season. Yeah, they're going really well. And I, I feel like if Thoris Green hadn't lost what they lost in the summer, they'd be in the same position. That That's the reason I think we attribute that to them being down the difficult position they're in right now. We mentioned Exeter, Harry. Why don't you tell us about their 1-1 draw with Sheffield Wednesday that happened yesterday? I think all in all, you'd probably say this was a good point in the end for both sides. If you'd offered a draw to Gary Caldwell before kickoff, I think he would have taken it. 
And if you'd done the same to Darren Moore with five minutes to play, he would have done the same. Uh, Timothy Deang and Giovanni Brown came back into the squad for Exeter after their draw with Morecambe, with Kegs Chalk also being handed a full debut with Harry Kite missing the game through illness. Darren Moore made just one change from his side's goal to draw with Derby County, brought back Josh Windass ahead of Alex Mighton up front. Both teams started brightly, and Jamal Blackman made a couple of crucial saves against Windass, who was looking very dangerous in the first half. It's first from a low free kick that he would have seen quite late, could easily have snuck into the bottom corner, and then one-on-one from the edge of the box, following a, a brilliant pass over the top from Barry Bannon. Wednesday fans will be concerned, though Bannon did have to limp off the pitch after playing that ball. Mm. Uh, I'm hoping it's just precautionary. He's been an absolute joy to watch this season. Uh, Darren Moore said in his post-match interview, essentially, that he doesn't know what the damage is at the minute. They're going to have to assess it this week and see how bad it is. But I'm sure you'll all agree he'd be a huge blow, not just to Wednesday, but to fans of League One football. He's absolutely lit the league up this year. I think he'd be a blow to the ones who aren't having to play him. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, That's the best way to sum it up. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone who's playing Wednesday in the next few weeks might be slightly less upset than the rest of us. (laughs) Yeah, indeed. Um, Exeter had chances of their own in the first half, and Josh Key saw an effort cleared off the line by Mark McGuinness to keep the game at 0-0. They continued their momentum into the second half, and they took the lead through the most unlikely of scorers as Jake Caprice fired into the bottom corner off the post from range. It was only the second goal of his career, uh, I think in about 380 appearances or something like that, uh, coming just over a year after his first. And I absolutely love watching goal celebrations from players who aren't used to scoring. He looked completely shocked when the cameras panned across to him. And he was just mobbed by his teammates. Um, Exeter didn't sit back and both teams continued to press for the second goal of the game. It could well have been the Grecians who got it on 78 minutes. David Stockdale attempted to play it out from the back. But instead of finding one of his teammates, he passed it straight to Jay Stansfield. uh, And he had to spare his blushes with a good save to keep the ball from going in. With time running out, Darren Moore brought on Callum Patterson who's been heavily linked with a move away this week as he's struggling to come by regular game time this season. But with the full-time whistle surely just moments away, he did what he does best and he grabbed the equaliser from, for Wednesday from the edge of the box. Caldwell will be absolutely gutted that his side didn't see the game out and come away with all three points, but he did give credit to his team in the post-match interview. Uh, and I, I quote, The best team in the league came here today and we've totally outplayed them from start to finish. I think they probably did deserve the win, but that was as much to do with Wednesday's poor finishing as it was to do with Exeter's good performance. Josh Windass, like I say, had those two great chances in the first half, and they had a few others that they could have done a bit better with. I wanted to just quickly mention Kegs Chalk, though. Uh, as I said, he came in for his first team debut today. He's he's played a few games in the Papa John's, and he's come off the bench a bit, but this was his first start, and he looked absolutely brilliant in the middle of the park. It's hard to believe that he's only 19, and I think he's one he's going to grow into this season, and he'll be a big part of the the second half of their season really so excited to see where he goes yeah i thought it was interesting that x the city's uh social media team on twitter quote tweeted somebody said we we've got to smash these today a sheffield wednesday fan said it and uh, I, I, was, I felt a bit gutted for them because if they'd held on it would have been a, a much better tweet i mean personally i, I suppose did I, they not tweet it till full time they, they tweeted before full time no they didn't they did it um oh they did I, it, thought it got, I thought it happened after full time they did it, uh, yeah, after full time it was, it was, it was 1 1, which is, you know, it doesn't have quite the impact. But I mean, to be honest, I think there's so many fans of these clubs who don't really understand how good some of the cl- sides in League One like Exeter are that there's always going to be comments like this. And I probably wouldn't have dignified that with a response from, from the official club Twitter account personally. I just think there's, there's a few morons out there who think that just because they're from a big club, they'll, they'll smash everyone. And I, I think the vast majority of Sheffield Wednesday fans are far more aware of uh, like Sunderland fans were I think how how difficult it is in this division to to get the results you need to get promoted it, it's it's not easy you you really do need to be at your best every game and Sheffield Wednesday proved again you know they've come away with a with an what could be a very important point despite not playing particularly well so it is they'll breathe a sigh of relief with that 90th ultimate equalizer from Callum Patterson as well and they stay in the hunt for those automatic promotion places. Burton Albion won, Derby County won, the world-famous A38 Derby. A hotly anticipated <laughs> fixture by all, maybe. A38 Derby, oh, this is great. This, this, is great. <laughs> this was, the, that's what it's called again. This was the first competitive meeting between these two since playing each other in the Championship in April 2018. Derby County had yet to win a competitive fixture against Burton Albion at the Pirelli Stadium. And they came close to getting it in this one. Derby's opener came midway through a first half that 
they looked very competitive in. It was a James Collins header that looped in over Ben Garrett to open the scoring. In terms of Derby standouts across the game, an immediate choice has to be David McGoldrick, which won't come as too big a surprise to many at all. This free roll he's got in the front line lets him make use of really clever touches to shield the ball to his opponent and create attacking opportunities to others around him. He's undoubtedly just a really classy player to have at this level and someone who can draw on his experiences from much higher up the pyramid as well. The main Derby star for me, though, was Erin Cashin, playing alongside Craig Forsyth in a completely left-footed centre-back partnership, which is something I don't think you actually see that often. It feels he, quite rare to me. He's been brilliant this season, Erin Cashin, Cashin, hasn't he? Cashin is everywhere. He's heading away balls into the box. He's clearing away balls down the channel. He's constantly getting tight to Burton Thorns when they receive the ball. He just always seems to be in the perfect place to clear up, to the point where I was actually getting annoyed how often he was getting there. How it's, old is he, though? He's like 20 or something, isn't he? He's, a, he's still very young. I think yeah. he's been re- in the Ireland squad so he's been making international level as well but it, it was so, it was generally quite annoying watching him just thinking you can't keep getting to absolutely everything please just give us an opportunity to get into the box but it wasn't happening um, that Collins goal the opener did spark Burton into life though and they, they would spend the rest of the game looking for a response opportunities did come the way in both halves I think a lot of credit needs to go to Dean and Marmaria for a tactical switch at half-time. He brought off Cameron ja- Borthwick-Jackson, who'd been looking largely ineffective in midfield, and brought on Tyler Nyango to lead the midfield press, playing further upfield, provide that link to the front line. Burton spent the second half knocking on Derby's door for an equaliser, though it is definitely worth mentioning a golden chance to Lewis Dobbin, fed through and behind on the break. One of one with Garrett completely lacked composure and fired his shot over the bar. That was a really big moment for Derby to just essentially seal the game with a 2-0 victory. I like Deshi Oshelaja. He's your number four playing in the number 10 role. <laughs> he, he was, yeah. He, he's all action him. He's... A, it's a bit like watching Vieira. That's what that's the comparison I made. It's one of the best <laughs> things Dino done with him, really, turning him to this all-action player who sometimes has to go into the fence because of availability, which is not really what you want. You want him as an all-action player in the middle of the park. Paul Warren went through a switch formation in the 74th minute. He brought Curtis Davis on to slot in between Cashin and Forsyth in the fence. Got Will Asula on as well to provide more pace up top. It's probably the wrong choice, though. What it ended up doing was inviting Burton on even more, and they would get their equaliser through who else but Victor Adebayejo. 10 league goals for him this season. He had nine football league goals across his entire career before this move to Burton. Absolutely, yeah. Incredible Crazy. development in a player. One final name I do want to mention for the Brewers, Bobby Kamwa, playing down the left-hand side. He was a three-agent signing post the transfer window closing. He hasn't had the preseason like other players have had, but he's rapidly getting better and better as the weeks go by. He's confident. He looks to take on his man at every opportunity. He's proving a handful to defenders and a really valuable asset for Burton Albion to have on a day where both them and Derby County extended their respective unbeaten runs. Wrap-up League One with two nil nils to mention. Cambridge United and Plymouth Argyle drew nil nil. It's not an ideal result for either, really. Cambridge are now just a point ahead of Forest Green Rovers, looking very nervously over the shoulders. Plymouth Argyle would have stayed top of the table with a win, but that draw means that Ipswich Town, coupled with their victory, have gone above them in the table as well. And Lincoln City and Wickham Wanderers drew 0-0 at Sinsel Bank. I will run through the League One table to wrap up this section. Ipswich Town, as we mentioned, now lead the way. They're top of the 45 points from 21 games. Plymouth Argyle after their draw, they're in second, 44 points from 21. Sheffield Wednesday hunting them down, though, 42 points from 21. And then there's quite a gap to the rest of the playoff and the playoff hopefuls. Barnsley are fourth with 33 from 19. Bolton are fifth with 32 from 20. Peterborough United somehow still sixth in the top six. Not quite sure how with the where they're playing at the moment. 31 points from six. Derby County could have gone above them with a win, but they ended up conceding the equaliser. So are seventh with 31 points. Portsmouth are on 29. You've got Wickham on 29. Shrewsbury on 29. Port Vale on 29. Bristol Rovers on 28, Exeter on 27, Lincoln on 27, 26, 25, 25, 24. There's quite a mixture of teams in there at the minute that all kind of might have their eye on those top places and they can pick a bit of form together. Down at the bottom, Morecambe didn't play yesterday. They had the game with Charlton called off. They're bottom of the table, 15 points and 20 games. MK Dons with that late defeat are down in 23rd. They're on 15th and 20. Burton Allen with their draw. On 22nd, they're on 16th and 21. Forest Green Rovers now looking the prime candidates to get out of the bottom four, finally. 20 points from 21 games. Cambridge United are a point above, and Accrington are also a point above as well, looking very nervously over their shoulders at the moment. Let's drop down and take a look at the world's best fourth tier. League 2. League 2, I'm going to begin with the Friday night fixture, the only one that took place before the weekend. Crawley Town nil. Hartlepool United 2. We've got new faces in the dugout at Crawley Town to talk about, but I want to make sure we put focus first 
On to the victors. This is only Hartlepool's third league win this season. It's a pair of goals from second half corners that have taken Pauls out of the relegation zone at the moment. Callum Cook's delivery first put home by a towering header from Roland Menehise. The second, another Cook delivery from the same side headed into his own net by Travis Johnson. I'm not going to lie. Had that been a Hartlepool player that had scored that, I would have called it a brilliant attacking header. It left Ellery Balkan with basically no chance at all. Um, I've spoken before about how I think Keith Curl has been dealt a very difficult hand with this Hartlepool job. He's inherited a squad that, for me, is one of, if not the weakest in the entire division. There are a few players in there who I think should be put in that influential bracket, though. One of them, undoubtedly, being Josh Romero up top, the top scorer. Another being Jamie Sterry, for me, at right wing back. Finally, back on a pitch and playing again on Friday night for Hartlepool. It's only the second full 90 he's had since the start of the season. There's been so many fitness problems to him across this campaign. And it's a big drop for me when you put someone like Regan Timilty in that position instead of him. So I really hope we get to see a string of him now because it could be really important for them if we do. Hartlepool really do need to add some quality when the January window starts, especially with some new forwards as well who can just be as convincing as Umera's looked so far. This is a good win for them, but you still left the deal a bit discouraged by them. There was a really heavy defeat to Stockport County last week and an example of the difficult season that they are having. I wonder if Keith Curl can go and use his contacts to get Harry Smith to come and play and give them that option up front. Cause, you know, I don't that, think he'd be a decent fit for them. He would. Be. He would. I don't think it'll happen. But I mean, I just think, you know, Keith Curl will have a player well, in mind. Well, not using him at the minute, are they? So, no, exactly. Yeah. They don't need him. So he And he's, uh, he's available. So, you know, that would be ideal mm. and Keith Curl's obviously I think managed him at Northampton probably comes comes yes, to mind. He will have, yes he will have been. so yeah I just think that would be a good signing quite, give them give them something because they need someone up front who can help Omer out and just he's good at holding the ball up he, he'll suit their set I'm not convinced stars. by Hamilton I think West Madonna has slashes maybe at best Clark Adore has been deployed even further back a lot of the time so it, it's basically Omer at the minute who feels so integral to them in forward areas and then... it's a very Keith Curl win wasn't it on on Friday, though, the two it was. corners. I mean, Callum yeah. Cook was the only one in that midfield that really felt like any real creativity with when you got Nicky Featherston and Mo Silla alongside him as well. It's mm. probably more defensive on the midfield than attacking one. They need, they need to add more for me. Um, Crawley Town, really, really poor night for them on Friday. They had a single shot on target in this match. Ooh. It didn't come until at the end of the game when Hartlepool had already gone two goals ahead. This was the second game in charge for the new Crawley Town boss. Matthew Etherington. He was appointed back at the end of November. Simon Davis has moved in as his assistant as well. And they came into place very shortly after Lewis Young left the club following a good, encouraging interim period. It was certainly a surprise to me to see Lewis Young not be picked. He looked the outstanding candidate, but Wagme have gone with a... Kevin Betsy 2.0. Yeah, in <laughs> Etherington and Davis... They are. It is like Betsy, really. I mean, they've, they've spent several years in coaching roles at Peterborough United. They moved to Crawley Town, as you say, with a similar reputation, reputation to what Kevin Betsy had, really. Promising coaches with limited managerial experience up to now. Last weekend, it went very well for them. A tuna win over Swindon Town to kick off their spell at the helm. This weekend, however, that was seen by Crawley fans as possibly the worst performance of the entire season, though. Against um, a poor team as well. And the against, goals yeah, they conceded. Against, against Dreadful the side goals. that shipped five to Stockport County just six days prior and gets in some really poor goals as well. Etherington was very honest with his thoughts on the performance after the match and that is refreshing because I do think there are other managers out there who would have tried to put a positive spin on things instead and there was no point in putting a positive spin. It was terrible and he was honest about it. There's a lot of disapproval towards Wagme United, the Crawley Town owners at the moment. This oh, season... Can't imagine now, why. Ugh. Yeah, it's it's been a very poor season up to now. Their methods and decisions have raised eyebrows from both fans and neutrals alike. The latest news coming out of Crawley Town at the minute is that Effington is not allowed to play Tom Nichols in matches, who is an incredibly influential attacking player for Crawley. The reason was explained by the director of football, Chris Galley, last weekend. There's been strong interest and an offer to Tom Nichols, and the club hierarchy has believed that taking him out of the squad to match days is going to prevent an unnecessary distraction for Effingtons and I'm using quotation marks when I say that as well oh, wank. That's James, when a, James <laughs> honestly when a manager's getting his team selection interfered with by people above it's not a good thing at all that's a shite I'm sorry to say I'm sorry but this is a club that I like I've said before on this podcast I, I have a, a lot of time for and I just think that being abs- the fans are having the mitt taken out of them by owners who haven't got a clue and I strongly resist this idea that they're the internet's team. Go, honest. It's Crawley Town. They should be. They should be Crawley Town's team. 
the town of Crawley, the town itself, not some internet. Team. This is just some nonsense, and it, it really annoys me. Um, as for the appointments, I have nothing against Matt Everington and, and Simon Davies. I think everybody who of my generation would have signed them at some point on Football Manager. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, nothing against them at all. I mean, they're probably very good coaches, but I think you've got to be careful because perception is, is nine-tenths of, of reality, isn't it? And you've just gone through Kevin Betsy. You've done that experiment. It didn't work. You've got a squad with more talent than it's being able to show, and you've gone and done exactly the same thing again. Um, it, it, you know, it, for them, it has to it has to work, or you know, they're going to be they're going to be losing the fans more and more. I mean, they've they've done so many stupid things this season already, um, which have not you know been a bitter pill to swallow for those season ticket holders and the guys that go week in week out. So. Yeah, let's give him time. But that was a shocking performance. Um, and yeah. you know, this Tom Nichols thing. I mean, Tom Nichols is a fantastic player. I just, what is that? That it should be up to the manager whether he plays him. I'm sorry, you, you don't take, you don't. Take, we we often see it where a player, if he plays one more game, it triggers an extension to his contract. Oxford had that with Lee Bradbury. It's happened with other players at other teams. And, and the chairman says, don't play him because I'm not, I'm not willing to extend his contract on his current wages. And the manager's hands are tied. In that respect, um, but this, I just—I remember Effington saying it last week when everyone was surprised to see Nichols out, and he said in the post-match interview, "It's completely out of my control. Mm. It's not good. Things were going really fine under Lewis Young, and uh, the concerns of Crawley Town are back again after an awful Friday night down at Broadhill Stadium." Well, that's Stadium. worth and mentioning in itself, isn't it, that they dismissed him out of hand when he's been such a loyal servant to the club and someone the fans really loved, and he kind of brought everything together again after a difficult spell in the bet. He was another eyebrow raiser. It's not the first one they've done this yeah. season. Not mm. great for Crawley right now. Harry, talk to me about Grimsby Town 2, Tranmere Rovers 1. Yeah, a game between two of the most out-of-form teams in the Football League. Grimsby had no wins in the league in six. Tranmere no wins in eight. So I think most neutrals probably would have had this nailed on to finish as a I'll just draw. say this has nothing to do at all with you joining this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the jury's still out on that one. All I'll say to anyone who's been paying attention is... My first appearance on this podcast, we were just coming off the back of five wins in a row. Tramway haven't won a game in any competition since. Coincidence. So, uh, Coincidence. Yes. Jay, do you want me to edit that out? Yeah, yeah, just delete that. <laughs> yeah. um, like, as if our dark horses cause teams to fall away as well. That's just, you know, it's just <laughs> rubbish. It, yeah, I'm sure it's nothing to do with us. But I, I was listening with dread there as you talked about the problems at Crawley because they're coming to Prenton Park next week. Uh, and anybody who follows Tranmere knows that we have a horrible habit of gifting wins to teams that need them. I think this game against Grimsby this weekend is perfect proof of that. Uh, Grimsby came into the game making just one change to the starting eleven. Danny Amos returned from injury. It was an unchanged uh, starting side for Tranmere from the goalless draw at Sixfields last weekend. Grimsby immediately started the game on the front foot and they were ahead after just seven minutes. John McAtee was given far too much space on the left wing and Brendan Kierman was found an even more space in the box to nod it in past Ross Dewan, who was left rooted to the spot. It was, just, it was an absolute comedy of errors watching it back. I just can't believe how sparsely filled our penalty box was, and th- there was so much space for Kean in there. Grimsby then thought they'd made it 2 0 with an almost identical goal. Across from the left again, landed at the feet of former Tramir player Otis Khan in the six yard box, but he was flagged offside. Tramir attempts to carve out chances as the half drew on. And I think our attacking performance of the last few months was perfectly summed up by a two-on-one that ended with Josh Hawks playing a ball through to Hemmings that was far too easy for Harry Clifton to cut out. Both sides created half chances as the game went on, but it felt like if anyone was going to score, it was going to be Grimsby, and that was the case pretty much on the hour. Otis Khan put a free kick into the six-yard box. Again, our defenders were nowhere to be found, and Niall Mayer was there to head it into the back of the net. Not long later, Tramir had somehow got a goal back. A substitute Jake Byrne. Oh, this is so funny. <laughs> Anyone who's not seen this, go and seek it out. Um, I think the, the official Skybet League 2 Twitter account have tweeted it out. Um, I think, Ed, possibly you've tweeted it out as well, haven't you? It's my favourite goal of the weekend. <laughs> get get yeah. from Grimsby. It'll be going on highlight reels up and down the country. Um, Jake Burton had, had just come on as a substitute up front, and he was pressing the Grimsby defence and a clearance from goalkeeper Mats Crocombe just bounced off the back of his legs and straight into the back of the net. Uh, I think at the minute, it seems like the only way we're going to be capable of scoring a goal, but it was at least refreshing to see uh, somebody playing up front rather than having a midfielder playing in a, in an attacking two. 
Uh, Ma- Mickey Mellon then took off midfielder Leo Connor and threw striker Joel Mombongo into the mix for his debut with just under 15 minutes to go. And he had the best chance of an equaliser as his header from close range went agonisingly wide. Grimsby's winless run has ended, and that's seen them leapfrog Tramir in the table. And I completely agree with Paul Hurst's assessment that it was comfortable for his side, who never looked like they had to get out of second gear particularly. They were also unlucky not to win a penalty late on, with a push on Danilo Orsi, deemed to be not a foul by the referee. I think it probably should have been a penalty, so they were unlucky not to get that one. Coming up the way that they did last season, I think that mid-table consolidation is probably a decent aim for the season for this Grimsby size. And they'll hope to build confidence off the back of this result and just sort of keep themselves treading above water away from that relegation zone, really. And, and then you can build next summer and, and have a look at maybe trying to work your way up from there. As for Tranmere, I'm very concerned about where we go from here. I Mel- bet you can't wait till your centre-backs come back. Yeah, I'd preferably put one of them up front as well, to be <laughs> honest. Um, I mean, Mickey Mellon was asked post-match if Mambongo's cameo meant that he's approaching match fitness. He's He got injured in pre-season. He's not been fit at any point since the league started at the end of July. And so he was asked, does this mean that Mambongo's nearly fit? And Mickey said, no, he's not even close. And I'm just glad that he came off the pitch not injured. Uh, so uh, that strikes of a, a man who's run out of ideas, really. And we did end the match with three strikers on the pitch, but you've also got two creative midfielders in Reese Hughes and Reese McAleer, who are sitting on the bench week in, week out, and are either not coming on or they're getting five-minute cameos at the end of the game. And our strikers haven't been p- performing particularly well, but if all the pressure is on the strikers, then you're going to have games where you don't score goals. And I think the thing that's frustrating our fans is that there are creative options on the bench and there are options to mix up the formation, mix up the style of play, and, and he doesn't seem keen on doing it at all. So, yeah, uh, congratulations to Crawley Town on the three points next weekend. Oh, don't be like that. Don't be like that. Trammies wait till a win goes on. I mean, on another story, they should have beaten Burton Abbey in the Neathill Trophy, but that's a different story. We'll, gl- we'll gloss over and move on. David, Newport County nil, Doncaster Rovers won. Yeah, strange one for me, this. Um, seemed like a game of two teams that were trying not to lose rather than either one uh, actively trying to win. Um, Doncaster probably coming out looking the, the better of the two sides throughout the game. However, they, they completely failed to be clinical at all. I mean, it seemed like the majority of their shots out of their 15 shots in this one uh, were all kind of coming from outside the box. They weren't really getting anywhere near. And um, to be honest, I don't think really anything was troubling Joe Day. Uh, that was until Kyle... And, Kyle Noyle um, scored the only goal of the game. A little pass back into him, and, and I'm sure uh, Joe Day is going to be quite disappointed by this one, considering that it's uh, been blasted into his near post. Um, not not much room there, and I'm not sure how Kyle, and, how Noyle of all people has, uh, has put this in. Um, but I think it sort of sums up Newport's performance here, uh, given uh, Graham Coughlin's uh, thoughts after the game. Um, some very interesting words. Um, he was quoted saying that he thought we were terrible. We were all uh, we're all angry. That performance is not like us. It's not what we've been serving up the last six or seven weeks. So we need to go away, analyse it, and see why we had so many players not at the races today. It's obviously disappointing, not just for me, but for the fans as well. They've had an off day. To a certain degree, I agree with what he said. But to be fair, I, I don't think either one of these teams were, were really at it. I think Doncaster have been fortunate to get something from this game. Um, and... Uh, I, to be honest, I think it would have been a fairer result for a nil nil draw, but um, you know, Doncaster are certainly not going to complain about the three points. Um, and I don't think Newport have been playing particularly well over the last few weeks anyway, so I'm not sure those comments are I'm completely in agreement with either. Yeah, Carl Carl Noor winner. My my main observation for this is um similar to last week. He's he's got Tommy Rowe playing less centre back at the minute in a three four three because he's got Tommy Rowe back there. I mean, I'm, I mean, Rowe's a versatile player, but. Get him further forwards to me, Schofield. I, I, the, the idea of playing a centre back to me hurts my head. I, I don't know what to think. And this feels like a, a pretty uneventful game. So uh, well done for getting some things from that, David. And yeah, disappointment to Newport. Pleasing to Doncaster to get the victory, I suppose, in the end. James will move on. Sutton United 1, Colchester United 0. Yeah, speaking of uneventful games, um, <laughs> it wasn't much, you know, when, you're, when, when the winning manager says this one won't live long in the memory, is the opening statement of his post-match come one of those days yeah it wasn't great the the only goal of the game came from Rob Milton a penalty um, conceded by Osama Ashley who was sent off in the early in the second half for two bookable offences I mean 
you know, it was a scrappy game. The pitch wasn't really conducive to good football anyway. Um, one thing I do think you have to give credit for is the fact that, you know, Sutton have some problems with centre backs at the moment. Joe Kizzy playing at centre back, with Enzo Boldrin playing at uh, at right back, and and they've obviously got issues with with players in that position. So to get a clean sheet and make sure that they win against a team who are sort of struggling down that bottom area. Um, was it very important? Alan Judge with a really nasty knee injury. He was actually lying on the floor when the penalty was awarded. It's a bit of a controversial one. Matt Bloomfield furious with the referee. Um, it was, I think, actually was, was given against him for a high foot. Um, but because of Judge's injury, it took like nine, ten minutes of of stoppage before the actual penalty was taken. Rob Nilsson. I mean, if you want someone to take penalties for England, that was mm. absolutely belted into the top corner. Goalkeeper had no chance, but. I think for Alan Judge, that might be his career, to be honest. He's um, struggled for form since joining Colchester. And if it's as serious as it looked, it's a long road back for a player of his age. And yeah, we'll see what happens. But yeah, it wasn't wasn't a great performance. Um, I think Matt Bloomfield blaming the result on the referee is a bit... Un- it's, it's, I've it's got to say, I haven't got any confidence in Bloomfield. I, no. I don't know what's at Colchester all. at the minute really disappointed me. They're, they're down to the bottom of the table now, following Hartlepool's winning their defeat. Oh, they're 23rd, sorry, at the moment, joint, joint bottom of the table at the moment, following that defeat and Hartlepool's win. Um, the, the lineup confuses me with Colchester constantly. I, yeah. I don't understand where okay. he chooses the players. I don't know why Sears doesn't teach more. I don't understand why Chilvers doesn't teach more. It's really confusing to me with Colchester at the minute. Yeah, they're where they belong, basically, right at the bottom. They're a terrible team. Um, I don't have faith in the manager. I, I gave him the benefit of doubt. Actually, I did. A, I've done a couple of sort of mini podcasts about Colchester. I just don't understand this team. Um, they're not well built. They're not well put together. They've got clearly some real bad issues, and and the most naturally talented players, like you say, not playing. Do me a favour. You know, if you're if you're if you're where you are, you've got no no. Chilvers has to start. I know he's been out of form this season, but he is such a good player. Um, and he offers something completely different to the options that they play on that pitch. And the fact he's playing Alan Judge ahead of him, um, mm, I don't know. Yeah, not good. Quick mention to the Sutton, though, as you say. It's starting to come on the men. they got Alistair Smith back into midfield as well. So it's been a long spell with Adam Lovett in there. He's been a lot more inexperienced, but good to have Ali Smith back as well. And Harry, hopefully Harry Butyman can be on the men soon as well, and they can start looking a bit healthier in midfield and long-term in defence as well and, and a nice win for them there on a, a day where I think they were rather comfortable I'd say again to Green Lane against Colchester United two more nil nils to run through to wrap up this episode Stevenage nil Mansfield Town nil Stevenage is still doing just fine really some opportunities to both sides here at, at, at this point I'll probably say to both sides really Stevenage staying up in the top places at the moment in their pursuit of promotion this season and Swindon Town nil ASC Wimbledon nil I would, draw that extends Wimbledon's nice little unbeaten run under Johnny Jackson and a run of clean sheets as well they picked up a bit recently hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about more in the coming weeks as well I'll run for the League 2 table to finish not everyone played yesterday we only had about half the league in action so Leighton Orient are still where they were 48 points from 20 games they draw up to 44 points from 21 Northampton didn't play yesterday they're on 39 from 20 you've got Barrow who were going to play Carlisle yesterday in a Cumbria derby and I'm a bit disappointed that didn't happen because yeah, that would have been quite a something should have but we'll see that another time they're on 34th and 20 Mansell after their draw up to 5th they're on 34th and 21 Carlisle at 6th 33th and 20 Bradford were going to play Gillingham today David I bet you're glad that didn't happen they've got 33 points from 20 games they're inside the playoffs as well Swindon just outside with 32 Salt on 31 Doncaster on 31 Walsall on 30 and AC Wimbledon on 30 complete the top half Gillingham down to the bottom of the table, 14 points from 20 games, still six goals scored. We, we, we talked about that enough. We don't need to go any more on that, really. Coach United in 23rd place, 13 points from 21 games. Hartlepool after their big, important win at Crawley Town, up to 15 points from 21. They're in 22nd. Rochdale just above, same points. We played 20 games. Then there's a little bit of a gap to Harrogate Town, who have 19 points from 20 and have improved a little bit recently as well. And then Crawley Town, the concerns are back for them. 21 points from 21 games they're looking back over the shoulder again and I hope Bethington can get things turned around because a bit worried about Crawley Town at the moment so that is going to wrap up this episode David Harry James thank you very much for your contributions today you're welcome cheers pal thank you brilliant join us again next week for more from the world's best third and fourth tiers we'll see you then goodbye <laughs>